The Bible includes two letters written by the Apostle Peter. He wrote these epistles in the first century just before he was martyred and Jerusalem was destroyed. But there isn't a hint of discouragement or despair in Peter's message. Discover the source of Peter's unwavering hope in the midst of crisis. Learn how to build the same hope in your life. Next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. People are desperate to find hope in this evil world, and they look for that often and most often uh, in other men. We're looking at a lot of political candidates running here in the U.S., and, and people are looking for someone who they can put their hope in or that where they can find hope. We're always, it seems, looking for hope. And yet, if you look at this civilization, which is facing human annihilation, according to all of the experts, then, uh, and, and our number one problem is that of human survival. And it's all because we look to men. That's the reason we're in this predicament we're in today. If you look at the long range, there might be a, a different uh, effect in a temporary arrangement, but in the long run, well, it looks pretty bad. The Apostle Peter was martyred in about uh, 67 to 68 A.D., and uh, that was just a year or two before the 70 A.D. Holocaust, which was one of the greatest crises in all the world and a type of what's coming upon us in this end time. Many of God's own people were turning away then. And Peter was doing everything he could in that turbulent time to also help God's people and give them hope. But most of them were turning away. And uh, if you look at the epistles of Peter, you'll find what I think is the greatest book of hope in the entire Bible. But still, Peter couldn't bring a lot of God's people back to their senses. Now, he was martyred. and. Paul had been martyred about two years before that, and other apostles had been martyred. So it was a terrible time for the church in that age. And what he wrote about, as I said, was just really a type of what's coming upon us in this end time. It was prophecy for this end time. And the same scenario is playing itself out. Our the, the troubled world is noticeable to anyone, and God's true people are turning away from Him and have turned away as they did just before 70 A.D. So what, what are we to do? Well, God says there is a little remnant that will teach and preach the hope of Peter and what he taught in his epistles. And it's, it's just the most exciting and enthralling hope you'll ever read about in your life. It's, it's vibrant and it's alive. It's a living hope. And isn't that what we need most of all today? Well, I, I certainly think it is. I want to uh, just mention that I believe in this uh, booklet, and we'll offer it to you at the end of this program, but there is a, an important lesson for us to learn, and I mean a really important lesson, because if you look to God, He's never hopeless. There is no hopelessness in God, and yet, how, how hopeful are we today? Where do you find hope in this world today? We're facing the worst crisis that man has ever faced. I mean, it's really looking bleak for mankind, and yet I can show you an entirely different picture. I mean, a picture of hope like you've never seen before or understood before, perhaps, and I think that's something we need to ponder very deeply. Peter had two epistles and, uh, and just focused mainly on hope, this, because it was such a terrible need 
at, the, at that time. People were running out of hope in many areas, especially around Jerusalem. And, and at the same time, the church was breaking, splitting up, and most of the people turning away from God. And that, of course, was the greatest crisis of all, because they were, well, about to lose their salvation in some cases, or a lot of cases. But in all of that, Peter said, look, there is a living hope that we should have all the time. And how can we have that living hope? How can you and I have it? I've, we've, we read about terrible things in the world. In recent uh, years, we've heard about there being something like 11 million uh, orphaned children in Africa because of AIDS. 11 million. I mean, if you look at that, it's just a, an overwhelming problem. We don't like to even think about it. But it's 11 million children that at least were children anyhow at that time that are orphaned because of AIDS. What do you do about a problem like that? How do you solve it? Where is there hope in that? Where do you find hope in a terrible situation like that? Well, there is a solution and we need to understand it. I want to read to you just something we wrote in the uh, Epistle to Peter booklet. Notice what Lang's commentary says about Peter's first epistle. No portion of the New Testament is so thoroughly interwoven with quotations from and allusions to the Old Testament. It contains in 105 verses 23 quotations, while the epistle to the Ephesians has only 7 and that to the Galatians only 13. Now, I think that's, that's really important because uh, the, uh, the more you understand the Old Testament and the New Testament, the more you're filled with hope. Now, that's not true of any other book or any other Bible, if you want to call it that. It's only in the, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible. You will find that hope there. Peter knew all about the Old Testament. He knew, knew the Bible as perhaps none, perhaps none of the apostles did. And he wrote about hope. He really understood the Bible. He dug into the Bible and he saw hope the way God sees it and had the same hope that God had and has. So, if you look at his writings, it, uh, you'll see that he, uh, it, or it says in Romans 10 and verse 17 that uh, faith comes by he the hearing of the Word of God. Well, so does hope. It comes by the hearing of the Word of God and the studying of the Word of God. We need hope, but we need a permanent hope. We need an eternal hope, not just a temporary hope or a dead hope, but a living hope. One that lives in our lives and makes us hopeful about what's coming in the future. And I mean, it's, it's, that great hope is getting extremely close to us. Thank God for that. Notice 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the eternal God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, are you, are you ready <laughs> to answer every man that asks you about the hope that is in you? That's what Peter's talking about. He said, look, I, I have an answer. They, to anybody that has a question about the hope that is in me, I have an answer. And did he ever? And you can find it in those two epistles. And it's all in one booklet today we, that we printed, and we'll send it to you for free. All of our literature is free. But I, I want also to, uh, for you to think about if you really want to build hope, and you do have to build it, you do have to work and study, to, uh, you have to put forth some effort to be able to build hope. And we have a correspondence course of 36 lessons, and if you read it and study it and work on it. We give you a lesson at a time. And uh, I, I'll guarantee you it will build hope in your life. 
But it, again, it does take some time, but it's a, an inspiring, uplifting, hope-filled study. <laughs> Believe me, it, that's the way it is in the Bible and no other book. That's the way it is. God commands us, for example, to rest on the Sabbath day. But did you know that He also tells you to labor on the Sabbath day? In other words, labor some, use some of that time to labor spiritually and see the Sabbath and see the future, uh, see God's master plan as He sees it and it refreshes Him, it says in Exodus 31. And it should refresh us as well, fill us with hope. Because we see this vision that God has for man and where this is all leading and why we're having all this suffering today. Because we choose it. We choose death and not life, as God said we should choose. Choose life. Choose a living hope. But the world has done just the opposite of that. God wants us to be filled with hope. Notice 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope, or the Revised Standard Version says a living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now if you look at the commentaries, they miss the whole point here. <laughs> They, they don't see it and they don't understand that, that the, where the hope is. It, the hope is in the begetto. The father has to beget the children or the sons and the daughters. He has, it is a begetto into the family of God in embryo and then actually born into the family of God when Jesus Christ returns. That is, at least the first fruits are born then. Others come later and others through a resurrection from the dead. So there's all kinds of hope in God's master plan. But look, if the commentaries don't understand this, is it possible you don't understand it, or maybe don't understand it as well as you need to, and that's why you don't have the hope in your life that you need to live and really produce? You need that, or else you bog down in despair. John 6 and verse 44 says, Christ said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, or begets him. God has to do it, but He has to do it to people who are willing to be begotten and willing to be uh, directed by God and taught by God and become childlike so God can teach them. And then they begin to be filled with that hope. We also have another large booklet, The God Family Vision, which will explain all of that to you. And let me tell you, it is a fabulous, fabulous vision, one that we all need in our lives. And it means everything when you under, uh, as far as your future is concerned. We need a, a, a living hope, and a book, booklet like that is just saturated with hope. And we need that. We need to, to build it in our lives so we can function with real inspiration and joy and happiness. We need that. God's people are being called today, a little remnant being called, and if they're willing, to, to help regenerate the entire world. Now, those uh, people that are given that opportunity, have an opportunity just that's just, well, the most splendid and wonderful opportunity you'll ever have in your life, or there ever will be for all eternity. I'll show you a little more about that in a moment. But notice verse 4 of 1 Peter 1, "...to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you." our hope in this inheritance. Colossians 1 and verse 5 says, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Then on down in verse 5, who are kept or guarded by the power of God through faith. Kept would better read guarded, which is a military expression. It, we, we are in a spiritual war. We have to fight the fallen Lucifer. 
and the sinning angels that followed him. We have to fight. There is a war going on. He, Satan wants to destroy our hope. He has no hope, and he wants to destroy your hope. Let's go on down to verse 5. It concludes by saying, Unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter was talking about the last time. Now I want to read this to you, and, and it's just, a, I think, a marvelous uh, understanding here. The International Critical Commentary also gives one definition for in the last time, and that's in verse 5, as, as, quote, in a season of extremity, or the, quote, unquote, or the, quote, unquote, the direct peril. This expression, in the last time, actually has a double meaning. First, please notice this carefully. First, it refers to the most extreme and deadly danger man has ever faced just before Christ's return. It's the worst time of suffering ever on this earth. Matthew 24, 21 and 22, and Daniel 12 and verse 1. Second, the Hebrew Greek Key Word Study Bible adds another meaning to, uh, quote, in the last time, end of quote. The word time is from the Greek word keros, and uh, that's 2540 in Strong's Concordance, a season time, but not merely as a succession of moments, which is chronos, 5550 in Strong's. But notice this, kairos implies that which time gives an opportunity to do, or opportune time, opportunity. That's, that's what these words mean. This, this last hour, this last little span of time is the most important opportunity that any people have ever had because they get to in introduce Jesus Christ to this turbulent, sinning, evil, destructive world that's about to destroy all human life if Jesus Christ didn't return. That's what Matthew 24 verses 21 and 22 says and many other scriptures. Never was there a greater opportunity for a man now, and especially before the second coming of Jesus Christ, where he can receive a reward that nobody will ever be given throughout all eternity. Now that's the opportunity it's talking about in this last time, and a lot of people are being given the opportunity. And we need to exploit it if we get that opportunity, of course. Notice verse 13. Therefore, gird up your minds, be sober, set your hope, set it, establish it. Make sure it's, it's founded and strong. Set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 and verse 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. I mean, that's a huge change. God is saying in essence, well, you build my character. Become you perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, that's the kind of character we need, but how much of that character do you see in this world today? Well, it's almost non-existent. And that's why we have all of these terrifying problems that we have to face all the time. Notice verse 5, You also as, a li as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So it, it's a matter of building character here. but. Peter is uh, very church-oriented, and he was talking to the church, but he didn't mention the word church. He, called, he, he wanted these people who were falling away or tempted to fall away to realize God was preparing them and as a holy priesthood to lead the world. So he didn't use the word church. Sometimes that can be meaningless to us because we use it so much. But he says, do you realize that God is giving you the opportunity to be a royal priesthood for all eternity and help Jesus Christ lead the world to God? A royal priesthood. Wow. 
I mean, after all, you know if you're going to be a royal priesthood or a king and a priest, as it says in Revelation 1 and verse 6, well, that you have to prepare for that. You have to get ready for that. You have to let God prepare you and train you and give you the character and the, the strength and the leadership to be able to fulfill that role. And what an opportunity that is. You, uh, you can be a royal priesthood. And God's people, God's little remnant, that very elect, are that today in embryo. They are that now. They're kings and priests now, it says in Revelation 1 and verse 6. And it goes on to talk about a, a royal priesthood and a holy nation in verse 9. Let me just read that to you. That, uh, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. I mean, here we're, it's a spectacular new nation that God has been creating all uh, for 6,000 years by calling out certain people and building a spiritual nation that is going to be resurrected at the second coming of Jesus Christ and will rule the earth with Him, rule all the people on the earth with Jesus Christ. Now that is something that's really special. Christ said we have to live by every word of God, live by every word of it to get ready for that awesome responsibility that God will give us if we will just become a part of the first fruits and heed His message and heed His calling, then all of that future awaits us. We have to prepare for those great, prepare for those great positions. And when you look at this world today, it's, it's just uh, one crisis after another. We really are living in the time of Armageddon. That's the, the time we're living in. And God says we ought to renew that inner man day by day. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 says, Study to show yourself approved. Study and pray and renew that inner man day after day. You can easily waste all your time before the television or any, any other pursuits that are worthless, maybe in a lot of cases, when we could be renewing that inner man and that inner hope that God wants all of us to have and should have, because God has it and He wants you to have it as well. Notice verse 19 of 2 Peter 1. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Now this uh, take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn, well, that's, that's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, when the, we'll have this wonderful world tomorrow. And then Revelation 22 and verse 16 calls Christ quote, the bright and morning star. That day star is going to arise in your hearts. Revelation 2 and verse 28 says that God will give you the overcomer, the morning star. You'll marry Jesus Christ. And he, He's the brightest star of all. And He's trying to call you out to make you one of the brightest stars forever. Now, that's, that's uh, that occurs, all that occurs after He comes, then we'll rise and be born into the family of God, and those that will be resurrected then will sit and share a throne with Jesus Christ, that morning star, the brightest of all the stars, and you'll become the brightest of, of the, all the stars. That, let's say uh, all those that come after His second coming you'll be brighter because you're, you were trained and taught in, a, in this terrible, evil world today to get prepared to help Christ, be a helpmeet to Him, to help Him rule the world and fill it with hope and joy and peace. Now that's something that is just, just breathtaking. It's so wonderful. See, He's going to give to us the morning star. He's going to give to us that, that brightness. That morning star, well, it, it's just brighter than all the other stars. 
God wants us to have this opportunity. Let it arise in your hearts, and you'll just be born in the family of God, and you'll be bright like that morning star. Certainly you won't have the same brightness Christ has, but you still will, will uh, have a brightness beyond what anybody else has coming after you. And that's going to be likened to that bright star because you're the bride of the bright star. Well, God is going to, uh, see again, take mankind to the point that He finally repents. That's what this suffering is all about, to teach mankind re to repent. God wants to fill them with joy. He wants to fill them with His, His love and His vibrant joy that we all should have now as well as in the world tomorrow. God wants His people to live and act and be the way He is, and that's full of joy and full of kindness and character and, and with a great mind. That's what He wants us to have, too. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. The Bible includes two letters written by the Apostle Peter. He wrote these epistles in the first century just before he was martyred and Jerusalem was destroyed. But there isn't a hint of discouragement or despair in Peter's message. Discover the source of Peter's unwavering hope in the midst of crisis. Learn how to build the same hope in your life. The destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in A.D. 70 was a type of the coming Great Tribulation. Many of God's apostles were killed in the buildup to that calamity. God's church was plunged into the darkest of times. When he wrote his epistles, the apostle Peter knew he would be crucified shortly. Caught in a storm of persecution, Peter delivered a message filled with hope. Request our free booklet, The Epistles of Peter, A Living Hope. You can discover the source of Peter's hope. You can see the vision that caused Peter to rejoice while suffering. Study The Epistles of Peter, A Living Hope to find out how. The Bible was written for our day. Request a free subscription to the Herbert W. Armstrong College Bible Correspondence Course for a systematic guide to Bible study. This 36 lesson course helps you see the relevance of the Bible to our day, explaining the cause of world problems. It gives you biblical guidance and practical solutions to the challenges in your life. Enroll in the Bible Correspondence Course to receive monthly lessons that will make the Bible more clear to you. Join 100,000 students worldwide who have gained valuable, life-changing understanding of the Holy Bible. Peter built an unshakable hope through deep Bible study. Now you can too. All our literature is available free of charge with no cost or obligation to you. Order today.